Cuban Missile Crisis is probably the most tense time in American history where we were at the brink of nuclear war. And if it isn't a result of Kennedy's great diplomacy, we may certainly have ended up in a World War III in a conflict with Russia that could have certainly turned nuclear. And so this period of time we know is the Cuban Missile Crisis from the time they kind of got things sorted out on what was happening to the time it was solved was 13 days. And that's why it's often referred to as 13 days in October. Now before we can get to the 13 days in October and talk about the crisis, we've got to set up the crisis. And so that's what we're going to do. And on October 14th and 15th, 1962, are the days in which we will set up the crisis. And the crisis itself will begin on the 16th of October. So the first two days, the 15th and 16th, we're going to tell you how we ended up with a crisis in Cuba. And from the 16th of October for the next 13 days, we'll tell you how we dealt with it. And it was really a tough time in American history. So the Cuban Missile Crisis, 13 days in October 1962, Part 1. October 14th and 15th, 1962, setting up the crisis. Now the thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm not sure you need to write this down, but the crisis involved the two most powerful countries in the world and the two most powerful leaders in the world. President Kennedy of the United States and Premier Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union. And we've talked about Khrushchev and his philosophy on Berlin and that type of thing. Now, the crisis doesn't begin in essence until October 16th. But the crisis really begins on October 14, 1962. And this is what happened on that day. An Air Force major by the name of Richard Heiser leaves Edwards Air Force Base in California piloting his U-2 spy plane. On the, on the 12th, excuse me, on the 14th of October, 1962, Air Force Major Richard Heiser leaves Edwards Air Force Base in California piloting his U-2 spy plane. He travels the length of the country and crosses the coastline of Cuba and photographs the island and it takes him 12 minutes to do so. So he leaves in his U-2 spy plane at 7.31 a.m. on October 14, 1962, flies the length of the country, crosses the coastline of Cuba and it takes him 12 minutes to photograph the island. Now that is considered a high level photography mission. On the deck or low level is a whole different thing and we'll get to that later. But this is a high level photography mission. He photographs the island in 12 minutes, he lands in southern Florida and he turns his film over to the CIA who then ship it to Washington, D.C. So Heiser lands in southern Florida. He turns his film over to the CIA who transport that film to the CIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. The next day, on October 15th, they developed those photographs and the photographs produce shocking results. So the next day on Monday, October 15th, these photographs were developed in Washington, D.C., and they produced shocking results. There were three men, mainly, that studied these photographs. Michael Davis, Dino Bruganoni, and Art Lundell were the three men that studied these photographs. Michael Davis, Dino Bruganoni, and Art Lundell. 
Now the first one to really study the photographs was Davis. And once he studied them, he stated that these photographs clearly showed long circular objects that measured somewhere between 65 feet and 100 feet long. So Michael Davis was the first one to really study those. And after looking at those, he was 100% confident that on the ground in Cuba were long circular objects that measured somewhere between 65 feet and 100 feet. These long circular objects were on the ground in Cuba. It was then that Dino Brugononi studied them even closer and determined that these long circular objects that were measuring between 65 feet and 100 feet were medium range ballistic missiles known as Soviet SS-4s. So Dino Brugononi determined that these long circular objects measuring between 65 feet and 100 feet in length were Soviet SS-4 medium range ballistic missiles. After determining that they were Soviet SS-4 medium range ballistic missiles, Brugononi also discovered that they had a range of approximately 2,000 miles. Now you've got to remember that Key West, Florida is how far from Cuba? Like 90 miles. So what's the only major city that this missile, these missiles couldn't hit? Seattle is exactly right. Seattle. So we're in trouble here. We have discovered that there are medium range ballistic missiles on the ground in Cuba. Art Lundell was the next to study the photographs and after he looked at them and determined what they were after visiting with Davis and Brugononi, he simply stated, quote, this is trouble, this is real trouble. Now on these quotes that we'll give you throughout this lesson, you only have to write down the ones I tell you. You don't necessarily have to write that one down. So, Art Lundell studies the photographs and he states to both Davis and Brugononi, this is trouble, this is real trouble. We have a problem, folks. We have intercontinental ballistic missiles, medium range missiles, in a communist country 90 miles from mainland United States. That'll take us to Tuesday, October 16th. This is really the official beginning of the 13 days that we're talking about when we're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis was Tuesday, October 16, 1962. This is the official beginning of the 13 days as we speak about it concerning the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's what happened on this day. At 9 o'clock in the morning, by 9 o'clock, President Kennedy had also been given some initial information on what was going on in Cuba. He already had an idea what was happening. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, he calls his brother Bobby, and he asks him to come to the White House immediately. So by 9 a.m. on the 16th of October, 1962, the President has been briefed briefly about what's happening in Cuba. And he calls his brother Bobby at 9 o'clock in the morning, and he tells him to come to the White House. And when Bobby arrives, President Kennedy fills his brother in with the early information that he has about those photographs. He gets his brother in the loop. Okay? And he tells Bobby that the CIA is going to give a formal presentation at 11.45 a.m. that morning. So Bobby is clued in on what's going on, and he's also told that the CIA will give a formal presentation to President Kennedy and several members of his cabinet at 11.45 a.m. The man that will brief the president and his cabinet on the situation in Cuba is this fellow right here, Marshall Carter. Marshall Carter, who at the time was working for the CIA. And at 11.45 a.m., Marshall Carter of the CIA gave this formal presentation to President Kennedy and several members of the Kennedy cabinet about the presence of missiles 
in Cuba. Okay. Now, he also informed them that there were missile launching pads being constructed. So the missiles alone was not that big of a threat because you have to launch them. And the launching pads were being constructed. In other words, it's an important term to hear, you'll hear it a lot, they were not operational at the time. So they did not have the ability to fire these ballistic missiles at the United States or anywhere else because the missile launching pads were not constructed, which meant they were not operational. But due to the flight and the photographs, they could see that they were under construction, that they were constructing them, and when they became operational, they would be able to fire these missiles at a range of about 2,000 miles. So that's what the committee was told. Now obviously, all members involved in this discussion, 11.45 a.m., knew that the United States would be in great danger if they allowed these missiles to be in Cuba or have the missile construction pads operational. There's no question. So what Kennedy did to try to explore options, because he can't do this on his own, is he puts together a committee to explore options on what to do about the problem in Cuba. He puts together a committee. He's going to need some input, some help. What type of people Naya, does he have? There's three different types of people on his committee. What type of people does he have on his committee? Not specifically, but what type of people? Absolutely, he's going to have selected military leaders. We'll tell you who these people are pretty quick here. Selected military leaders. Who else is he going to have on that committee? Leighton? Selected members of his cabinet. Selected members of his cabinet. And the third part of his committee were simply he's going to look around and find other influential government leaders that might have some experience and expertise on what to do. Okay, he's going to look for other experienced government officials, influential government officials that might have some experience or some expertise on what could be do done about this issue in Cuba. Now this committee is going to be officially called the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. The Executive Committee of the National Security Council. You can write that down if you want, or you can just shorten it to XCOM. And that's what we will call it from this point on. The official name is the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, but we're going to refer to it and it was much better known as XCOM. XCOM. We won't make you responsible to know Executive Committee of the National Security Council. We'll make you responsible to know XCOM. Okay. Here are the key members of XCOM. Now, now we can get specific. Anybody tell me who specifically they think might be on this committee? Bobby. Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General. Very good. Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, will be on this committee. Are you still in there? Anybody else want to take a shot other than the ID sheet? People we've already talked about. Who else might get on that committee? Johnson. Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Very good. Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Nick, who might else you have on this committee? Your Secretary of Defense. Robert McNamara. Who else might you have on there? Laramie? You're the president. Who deals with foreign affairs in this in the country? Who what cabinet member? The Secretary of State, which is Dean Rusk. R U S K. Dean Dean Rusk. So you're gonna have your Secretary of State. Other than new people on the ID sheet, who else might you have on that committee? Who briefed you? CIA. So you want the CIA Director John McCone. CIA Director John McCone. Who else might you want on there? You're going to have to probably eventually speak to 
speak to the American people, not early, but maybe later. Okay, they, that's a good point. Everybody says Press Secretary Pierre Salinger. They don't have him involved at all. They don't even let him know what's going on because if he knows, the press knows. And that's not what they want because they don't want people to panic. But who might help Kennedy? His speechwriter, very good, Theodore Sorensen. Presidential speechwriters on the committee, Theodore Sorensen. Is he going to be, have to be in the know? Well, certainly he is. Okay? He's going to write the president's speeches about this. Who's an old son of a gun that I always told you he's a great politician, just poor guy couldn't win an election, but he's very good. He's the, he's the UN, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Adelaide Stevenson, United States ambassador to the United Nations. Adelaide Stevenson will be a big player in this. U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Adelaide Stevenson. Who else? Come on. We talked about military personnel. We talked about one. I told you that he was appointed as chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and we would be talking about him later. A General Max, very good. General Maxwell Taylor. I'll give this one to you because I thought it was a little unusual, but Kennedy had the Secretary of the Treasury, C. Douglas Dillon, on the committee. He had the Secretary of the Treasury, C. Douglas Dillon, on the committee. Who else might he have? we got three left that uh, we've talked about. One is crucial. And you might say, well, why would he have him on the committee? Because he's just the appointment secretary. Kenneth O'Donnell. He'll be crucial. Yeah, he trusted him. He needed somebody close to his side. Kenneth O'Donnell. The appointment secretary. You won't be, this I'm not blaming you for not knowing this. This old bugger here, this old battle axe, this old Cold War veteran, Dean Acheson. He was President Truman's Secretary of State. And do you remember he was one of the guys that Joseph McCarthy investigated? on being communist, and I said, hey, this guy will come back later and we'll talk about him. Dean Acheson, his last name spelled A-C-H-E-S-O-N. A-C-H-E-S-O-N. Dean Acheson. He was former Secretary of State under President Truman. Charles, why would they bring in Dean Acheson from the Truman administration? Experience, and he's been fighting the communists through Cold War as Secretary of State back during the Truman years. So he's going to be kind of a crucial player in this thing. Now, getting to our ID sheet. The Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General Curtis LeMay. This fellow right here. Interesting dude. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this campaign sticker. Wallace LeMay. We'll talk about that later. So, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General Curtis LeMay. Commander of the U.S. Tactical Air Command. Commander of the U.S. Tactical Air Command. Commander of the U.S. Tactical Air Command, General Walter Sweeney. Commander of the U.S. Tactical Air Command, General Walter Sweeney. And this man right here, the last member of significance, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral George W. Anderson. Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral George W. Anderson, Jr. So, members of XCOM, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, Secretary of the Treasury C. Douglas Dillon, Vice President of the United States Lyndon Johnson, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, CIA Director John McCone, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Adlai Stevenson, Presidential Speechwriter Theodore Sorensen, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Maxwell Taylor, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force General Curtis LeMay, Commander of the U.S. Tactical Air Command, General Walter Sweeney. Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral George W. Anderson, Jr. Former Secretary of State under President Truman Dean Acheson. President Kennedy's Appointment Secretary, Kenneth O'Donnell. 
Donald and the National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. And the National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. Those are the members of significance of XCOM. So, what happens? Kennedy forms this committee and they get together and they're trying to find a possible solution in Cuba. They're looking for options, right? They're looking for options. What's the most obvious option, Rachel Carver? Um. Military force. Na <laughs> the military force. Airstrikes followed by invasion of American troops. Kick ass and take names, right? That's what you do. Somebody's threatening your safety 90 miles away, you use military force. We are going to launch airstrikes against Cuba, followed by invasion. That was the obvious option. Obvious option. Well, as they're discussing the use of military force, new intelligence <coughs> comes into President Kennedy. And the new intelligence says that there are 26 Soviet merchant ships sailing to Cuba. And we don't think they have baby food on that. We don't think they have supplies. We believe strongly, XCOM, that what's on those merchant ships? More missiles. More missiles. So during this time, the military option was being discussed. President Kennedy receives more news concerning Cuba. The United States Navy had sighted 26 Soviet merchant ships heading towards Cuba, and it was the belief of XCOM that these merchant ships had a high likelihood of carrying missiles to Cuba. How do you think those other missiles got to Cuba? 